Welcome to the History Unplugged podcast, the unscripted show that celebrates unsung heroes, myth busts historical lies, and rediscovers the forgotten stories that changed our world. I'm your host, Scott Rank. When it comes to holding power, there's something special about the position of admiral compared to being a president, a general, or a CEO. The word admiral comes from the Arabic Amir al, which means commander of, the phrase Amir al Bahar, commander of the sea. Think about what that looks like if you command an entire fleet. You have millions of tons of destructive capability, controlling an aircraft carrier, destroyers, submarines, other things in your flotilla, tens of thousands of sailors whose lives are directly under your control. But as you're fighting, you're not just fighting an enemy navy, you're also fighting nature. There could be a storm that's occurring. There could just be simple inclement weather, but it would be as if you were a general fighting a battle, but you're having to deal with a volcanic eruption and earthquake at the same time. So there's a special level of power and challenges that you face while you're leading as an admiral. In this episode, I'm going to be looking at the 10 greatest admirals in history with an admiral himself, four-star U.S. Navy admiral and former Supreme Allied Commander of NATO, James Stavridis. He's the author of the new book, Sailing True North, 10 Admirals and the Voyage of Character, who looks at 2,500 years of history, starting with Themistocles, going to English Sea Captain Francis Drake, Horatio Nelson, Chester Nimitz, and many others. He looks at their stories to illuminate the most essential qualities of character and how it contributes to effective leadership. So there's a lot of stories of the challenges they faced, their colorful backgrounds, some of the greatest admirals were originally pirates. And as an internet content marketer, I would be remiss if I didn't hold him to the fire and ask who is the greatest admiral in history, which he answers very well. So I hope you enjoyed this discussion with Admiral James Stavridis. Admiral Stavridis, welcome to the show. Great to be on with you, Scott. Something that I was really intrigued by when you were writing this book, what I was thinking is that you have an insight into what it would be like to be an admiral and it's part of a select group of people across history. So here's what I'm wondering. Let's say you're leading a carrier strike group. You're looking over the entire fleet from your command position. A carrier strike group, for listeners who wouldn't know about it, it has about 7,500 personnel, an aircraft carrier, one cruiser, six to 10 destroyers and frigates in the flotilla, a carrier air wing of 65 to 70 aircraft, including submarines. You're overlooking all of this, and maybe you think, Every single life in this fleet, I have command over. Every single ship. How do you describe that sensation? Is it like being at the top of a pyramid? Is there burden, responsibility, fear, excitement? So what is that like? And what insight did that give you into other admirals across history? Well, first of all, it certainly is like being on the top of a mountain. And yet, as you know, Scott, at the top of the mountain is where the strongest winds blow. So point one for anyone when you're at the top of any leadership organization, whether you're running a radio station in Greenville, South Carolina, or an art gallery in Phoenix, Arizona, or you're just a working mom or working dad around a kitchen table with your family, whenever you're at a leadership position like that, I would encourage people to consider the following. Leadership, we all kind of get. It's this big door that swings and we influence others. When I was Supreme Allied Commander of NATO, I influenced through leadership 3 million soldiers and sailors and airmen who were part of the 28 nations of NATO. So leadership is this big door that swings. But that door, Scott, swings on a very small hinge. And that hinge is your character. Leading others is all about leading yourself first and having that ability to to bring those qualities of creativity, resilience, humility, balance, the things that are internal, that's what influences uh, leadership. And that certainly is what I felt as a strike group commander or later as a supreme allied commander or even as a young commander in my first command of a destroyer. You choose uh, 10 different admirals that you look at. There's people like Themistocles, uh, Francis Drake, the English sea captain, Horatio Nelson, Chester Nimitz from World War II, and others, Zheng He. I've talked about him quite a bit as well. How did you choose these 
leaders, these admirals, and exclude others? It's a great question. And part of the enjoyment of the book is to speculate on which admirals would you have included otherwise, or which ones didn't quite make the cut. And we can go there if you want. But I would say the way I got to this group of admirals was really through a a lifetime of encountering them, starting with my own studies when I was a midshipman at the U.S. Naval Academy, stories I would hear from other naval officers, my own reading of history over years. And I, I tried to pick admirals who had both highs and lows in their lives, because I think that real character, that inner voyage comes from the challenges we face on the inside and how we deal with them. I also wanted a historical sweep. I wanted a cultural sweep. I mean, we're, we have a Greek-American admiral from 2,500 years ago. We have Admiral Zheng He, as you mentioned, 500 years ago. But we come all the way up to the present with Admiral Grace Hopper, who pulled the Navy into the computer age, or Admiral Hyman Rickover, who created the nuclear Navy. So I wanted uh, geographic diversity. I wanted temporal diversity. And I wanted, above all, to be able to showcase a package of qualities and attributes of character. That's how we came up with these admirals. Can you think of a couple of examples that you really think stand out for leadership? Because you mentioned earlier that in every single one of our lives, we have some arena in which we're leaders. But I could imagine the sense of isolation and loneliness of being a leader in a way that very few people could relate to would be a unique experience. So what are a couple of examples you can think of of leadership amongst these people that stood out to you? Uh, in uh, in sailing true north, as we we get through these admirals, two really stand out for me. One is a British admiral from uh, the early 1800s, Lord Horatio Nelson, Vice Admiral Nelson. He fights the Battle of Trafalgar. He wins this epic struggle to defeat Napoleon's navy and effectively save Great Britain from an invasion. He's a marvelous builder of teams. He cares deeply about his sailors. He's really the complete admiral yet. He has a moral compass that perhaps is not quite where it should be. He he has an, an adulterous affair. He um, ends up having a child, a daughter out of wedlock. He violates a lot of the norms of behavior of that period of time. So he's courageous, creative, decisive, but he's also morally ambiguous. So Lord Nelson, I think, is one that's worth studying and thinking about. And another one is the American Admiral Nimitz, Chester Nimitz. There'll be a movie coming out in the next couple of months um, about the Battle of Midway, which was the epic battle that he was the Pacific Fleet commander for. And Nimitz was understated. He was quiet. He had uh, kind of quiet self-confidence. He took command of the Pacific Fleet when it was literally smoking in ruins in front of him at Pearl Harbor. And he rebuilt that fleet, built a team of leaders together, and won the Second World War. So he's kind of a model of steady, calm, resilient, um, and also high marks for humility and empathy. Pretty powerful positive example. The two of them, I think, are are pillars of the 10 admirals in sailing true north. One other factor that you hinted at with Horatio Nelson, he had rough qualities to his character. And something that intrigues me about the Navy in empires or nations across history is that sometimes it seems you get rougher characters who make up the sailors, they have reputations on shore leave and other things. But also, it's interesting, you seem to get those in command positions can come from very colorful backgrounds compared to other armed forces. My purview was the Ottoman Empire, and the great hero of the Ottoman Navy, Hydretin Barbarossa, was a Barbary pirate before he was an admiral. You could see similar things with Francis Drake. And not that people weren't from rough backgrounds in other branches of the armed forces, but there seems to be more of a legacy of being of the landed gentry if you were in the army or, or in that type of command position. So do you think there's something to this? And could this be a positive thing if you have a rougher background and then you have a respectable position? Can these lower qualities that made you a pirate be transmuted into something good? Absolutely. And I'm glad you bring up Barbarossa, who is an admiral that I thought about, including obviously has those characteristics and qualities you mentioned. The one who made the book is Sir Francis Drake, who was 
both a patriot of England, but also a pirate, not to put too fine a line on it. He was someone who was able to absolutely inspire, but was also brutal in the way he uh, he went after people. And so I think you're right. And I think the reason is, is because the oceans themselves are so ever changing. You have to be constantly ready uh, to, to change course, to, to know a storm is coming. Um, you're fighting not only the battle of combat with another Navy, but uh, Scott, you're also fighting against nature itself out at sea. And I think that tends to toughen you. And someone who comes up through a naval background can often have those kind of qualities that you need to be in a rough and tumble world in order to be able to succeed. Are there particular stories that stood out to you looking at these people that you think perfectly sums up who they were? And what I have in my mind asking that question is Theodore Roosevelt. There are many stories, but my favorite is when he was going to give a 90 minute speech, was shot by an assassin, determined it wasn't fatal, and then he proceeds to give the 90 minute speech. And I think that sums up Teddy Roosevelt there. Were there any things like that, whether in battle or leading those on a ship that you think sums up uh these admirals that you looked at? Uh, absolutely. And and let's go back to Nimitz for a moment and consider the sequence of events as he takes command of the U.S. Pacific Fleet. Uh, Japanese surprise attack. The battleships are all sunk and broken in front of him. The aircraft carriers are out at sea, dodging the Japanese carriers. His entire ambition in life has been to become the commander of the U.S. Pacific Fleet. But what happens is just as he arrives to do that, it's destroyed. And so instead of taking command in a beautiful, crisp, white uniform on the deck of a battleship, he has to take command of the Pacific Fleet in a rumpled set of khakis standing on the deck of a diesel submarine. I mean, that is true resilience, really quite remarkable. <clears throat> One other admiral I would point to in that regard is Themistocles the ancient Greek admiral from uh, 2,500 years ago, when the Persians are attacking and, and uh, want to crush this nascent democracy in Athens and really of Greece itself, the Persian emperor Xerxes brings a massive, massive fleet, uh, thousands of these triremes, these road vessels, and the Greeks are outnumbered somewhere between five and ten to one. Uh, and yet Themistocles gathers his captains together the night before the battle and tells them, you are all free men. Slaves row the Persian fleet. You are free and you are free tomorrow. And tomorrow you must row for your city. Tomorrow you must row for your family. Tomorrow you must row for freedom itself. And the Greeks went out and destroyed that Persian fleet, saving democracy. And um, I think at that moment of Themistocles gathering himself and trying to think of what to say to inspire these Greeks to go out and win that epic battle. Those are two moments from Sailing True North that really stand out to me. Could you uh, spend a little time discussing Zheng He? And just for a nugget of context for listeners, he was a 14th century Chinese admiral. Once the Silk Road is not as safe as it was in previous centuries with the fall of the Mongol Khanate, leads a massive, massive treasure fleet across the Indian Ocean world. He wasn't a military hero in the way some of the other people that you discussed. It's sort of a Lewis and Clark on a, on a thousandfold scale in one sense, I suppose. Uh, so could you describe his story and then also – what stuck out to you from his life and leadership? Yeah, let's start with his beginnings. He is a young Mongol child who is captured when he's about eight years old, enslaved and castrated. So he is starting life with obviously the most wretched status you can imagine. So first and foremost, his story is one of resilience. Um, and he rises relentlessly through the ranks based on his talent, uh, his ability to organize. He's an extraordinary detail oriented, but also a very capable combat warrior who fights at the side of the Yongle emperor. And eventually the emperor reposes such enormous 